Robert Haley, who's an epidemiologist here at UT Southwestern. And today we're gonna to be talking about learnings from the Spanish flu. So Dr. Haley, thank you for joining us. We're happy to be here. Yeah, it's a different experiment with social distancing and technology, trying to make it work. Um, now, granted, you're an epidemiologist. Can you tell us a little bit about what happened with the Spanish flu and why are people <laughs> comparing COVID-19 to the flu? Well, uh, the what we call the Spanish flu, actually it really wasn't, but uh, uh, that was probably the greatest, most destructive pandemic in the history of the world, worse than the, uh, the Black Death and any of the others. Uh, it killed uh, somewhere between 50 and 100 million people worldwide, about six or 700,000 in the United States, which was a significant portion of a smaller population back then. Mm -hmm. it prop we don't really know where it originated. This virus mutated to this virulent form uh, in and first appeared in, in ironically in Kansas, in western Kansas, in a small town and produced a huge mortality rate. And a doctor there wrote a, a paper in a local in a medical journal describing how bad this was, but uh, nobody really noticed it. Uh, it quickly spread. And, and the actual reason it spread is known, a, a person uh, who was on active duty in the military, getting ready to deploy to World War I, uh, was, went home to this town in Western Kansas from his unit at uh, Fort Riley, which was on the other side of the Eastern side of the state, went home, got exposed, came back, became ill and started the epidemic at Fort Riley. And it became a huge problem there with large numbers of soldiers dying, mm -hmm. but uh, the medical uh, officers on the post uh, recommended that the commander quarantine the entire post, but he says, don't you know there's a war on, and he ignored them and began shipping his troops by train to other uh, forts, other military places throughout the country, uh, for example, to uh, Fort McPherson in Atlanta, and wherever those troops went, there were outbreaks of this flu, which, which killed a lot of people. But we were uh, just gearing up in World War I, shipping troops over. So troops were immediately going over, quickly spread it to France, uh, all over uh, Western Europe, and then uh, to the German side. Uh, and before they knew it, the entire uh, European theater was engulfed. But it it sort of remained in the military population. As you can right. imagine, there wasn't a whole lot of uh, relationship between the military and the civilian world. Um, and it was so severe though in the military that it probably had a lot to do with ending World War I uh, mm -hmm. in uh, late 1918. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, uh, the symptoms were quite unique. Uh, it was a awfully a, often a very rapidly progressive uh, illness that you would you would get sick in the morning, become deathly ill in the afternoon, and you would be dead in the evening. It was that oh uh, virulent, but not for everybody. Uh, right. It's thought that uh, people died first of a viral flu, an overwhelming pneumonia. Uh, that would kill them first from, and they would turn blue from hypoxia, lack of oxygen, and die quickly. Um, so those who survived that might develop then a bacterial pneumonia, the classic uh, right. the con uh, standard pneumococcal pneumonia that we know about. But it, but having flu uh, particularly uh, made the lungs more more vulnerable to bacterial invasion. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, the normal pneumonia back, uh, uh, bacteria was much more able to invade, to get a hold and produce a fatal pneumonia. Uh, gotcha. People actually, it, it, it affected the brain also. There was uh, influenza, uh, encephalitis, uh, spinal mm -hmm. cord damage, brain damage. Uh, you, would, you would go into a coma or become paralyzed. But the, the worst complication though was usually on the fourth, fifth, or sixth day, something like that, you might be uh, going along fairly sick, but not bad. And then suddenly you would worsen and 
uh, have a, a, a just a crash and um, it would damage all the organs in your body, liver damage, kidney damage, uh, you know, brain damage. And this is what we we think now was what we would today call uh, acute respiratory distress syndrome, okay. which is called, it's a it's a um, it's a huge outpouring of your own immunologic system, and your okay. immunologic system just just gets turned on and starts running out of control, uh, completely out of control, so that it attacks the body all over and basically destroys your body uh, from oh, wow. the inside. And, and we today call it a cytokine storm. Cytokines are some of the little proteins that the immune system uses to attack uh, mm -hmm. invaders in, in the body. And you have a, a cytokine storm that is uh, fatal. And in the autopsies that were done in that era, it looks like about 50% of the people who died in the, the great uh, flu pandemic were due to cytokine storm and acute respiratory distress syndrome. Wow. So, so given, I mean, obviously that, that sounds tr traumatic and I know we're not quite there with COVID-19 yet, but what learnings can we take from that period and apply to what we're dealing with today with yeah. COVID-19? Yeah, of course. Uh, also in that thing, uh, doctors and nurses died disproportionately because they were treating the sick and they got it and died. And that's one of the lessons we learned is that in these outbreaks, and you, you know this is being applied today, the first rule is you have to protect your doctors and nurses and technicians because if they go, then there's no help for anybody. And right. that's what happened back then. Of course, there wasn't much they could do anyway. Uh, also, researchers madly tried to identify the germ that was producing it. And there were a lot of research going on and they identify what they thought was it, but it turned out and they named it Haemophilus influenzae, Haemophilus of the flu. It turned out it had nothing to do with the flu. It was an innocent bystander. Uh, but anyway. Uh, so you mentioned though protecting protecting the doctors and the nurses and the frontline providers. I mean, what are our, is that where we came up with the, you know, everybody wants to make masks today, yeah. make masks and hair bonnets. Masks, How important is that? Yeah, masks and gowns and uh, uh, face shields. These are the critical things for, for protecting our uh, doctors and nurses, healthcare workers, first line workers. Uh, and those are, those are fairly effective at doing it. But mm -hmm. of course, you don't have them or if you have to wear them for several days and they lose their effectiveness, then you're, we're back in 1918 again. Uh, gotcha. One of the things we've learned is um, uh, there, there are great stories from that time, particularly the story about Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. uh, and this was very instructive in our public health. For, for decades, I've been hearing this story and we talk about it at all of the meetings where we are discussing what we're going to do when we get the big pandemic. What happened is when it first hit, uh, the, we, we were in the midst of gearing up for World War I and there were these uh, uh, war bond parades for selling war bonds and each okay. city had its quota. And, and in Philadelphia, uh, <clears throat> the leaders, actually there was a very powerful senator uh, named Dr., uh, Mr. Vare, who was controlled the machinery of Philadelphia, and he stood to gain a lot of money from that parade. And so he insisted that they go ahead with the parade. So people turned out, were lining the streets, and you can imagine yeah. cheering, yelling, and yeah. screaming. And when you yell and scream, of course, you are just throwing out virus all over everyone around yeah. you. And <clears throat> at, up to that point, they'd only had a, a small number of cases. And about four to five days later, and, and certainly by 10 days, they were having hundreds of thousands of cases. Whereas mm -hmm. uh, comparable cities uh, who took those precautions, called off the parades, called, call, asked people to stay at home, okay. social distancing, they were actually trying. They, they yeah. closed schools, they closed businesses. Those cities had much less of a problem. And interestingly, when the whole thing was over, the cities that had done the best job of the public health uh, precautions 
ending the uh, preventing it from getting large, those had the largest economic recovery. Whereas the place okay. in Philadelphia that had ignored that and had gotcha. problems, they were devastated and it took them a long, much longer to recover economically. So uh, the social distancing then has been shown to be effective and that's why we're encouraging great. it today. There's no doubt. One of the big lessons from that was the difference between the cities that practiced that and the cities that didn't. Uh, it was st stark reality and uh, that that has been taught in all the public health uh, courses and so forth ever since then. Another gotcha. lesson we learned is that this thing traveled around the United States, over to Europe and around the world by people who were traveling. All right. Okay. And, and of course, then we were we were sending troops over to the war. So there was a huge amount of, of very, very right. rapid travel, shipping these people, many of whom were infected or just carriers uh, by mm -hmm. rail, by ship and so forth. And that spread it. So that another lesson. And so when you have this, we don't want people to travel. And you know, right. right now, if you, you look around Dallas, the uh, the parts of town where you have the most cases are the people, people where uh, you have uh, the travelers, uh, the wealthier people who were able to travel and uh, kind of ignored the warnings, sent their kids off for a spring break, you know, and uh, we've missed the list, the lesson of World War One by, by ignoring the warnings and going ahead and traveling. Oh, this won't matter. You know, I'll just take one trip and I'll be careful. No, it doesn't work that way. This virus is right. too cagey and too persistent. Um, well, Dr. Haley, we have, we have a couple questions coming in for people that are watching this. So I want to take sure. a minute and get to them. Sure. Here's um, two from Crystal Zadel Barrett. And her questions are, what are some of the factors that allow a virus to cause a pandemic? And why did MERS and SARS not develop into a pandemic while COVID-19 has? Oh, good questions. Uh, what happens is these are these viruses, w before the epidemic, they were innocent viruses. The problem is <clears throat> there's certain viruses. Those are viruses that have RNA at their core instead of DNA, the more primitive viruses like these. They are very prone to mutating. And when they mutate, uh, most of the time, they, they don't result in anything dangerous. But once in a long while, you'll get a major change in a virus that, that is able to survive. And if that change happens to make it uh, more uh, able to attack people and to spread among people, then you have a virus, a major shift in the virus that then can spread around. And if it's virulent, then it can kill, spread around and kill a lot of people. That's very rare to happen, and that's why these pandemics are very rare. Uh, now, what about SARS and MERS? SARS and MERS were very virulent, uh, and they were very spreadable, too. Uh, the difference was uh, the, the public health community recognized this early, and we had leadership in the country that took the measures that were necessary to bottle them up quickly. And they were uh, every place they went, you, you know, it started in uh, SARS started in China. They tried to cover it up for a while, but it finally got out, fortunately. And uh, within a within a couple of months, we had the virus uh, uh, sequence. So we knew exactly how, how it worked. We we're able to develop tests and so forth. And every case that showed up in this country, we detected quickly isolated the person and their contacts so that it didn't spread. And so it was it was stamped out very quickly. And fortunately, it didn't come back. It, it might have. Now, MERS was similar. It arose in Saudi Arabia, interestingly, perhaps from camels um, and uh, was very devastating in Saudi Arabia and in, in parts of the Middle East uh, and spread somewhat to Europe. Uh, but again, it was recognized and uh, bottled up. The leadership took very strong action, listened to the public health experts, took the action to bottle it up, and it uh, it has not come back. So we've been fortunate. Okay, good question, Crystal. Thanks for joining. Here's one, Dr. Haley from Armin. 
And this is, it's a little long, so I'm going to read it. It says, is there a possibility that if COVID-19 isn't treated before flu season begins, that there could be a recombination of genetic material between the flu and COVID-19 resulting in a different strain? Uh, unlikely that it will uh, combine with flu. Those are very, very different viruses uh, that probably won't mix, uh, almost certainly won't mix. But uh, that doesn't mean that it might not change as well. And uh, I think it's very likely that this will die out as the summer comes on. Now, this is controversial and uh, not many people are willing to talk about that. But uh, I think it probably will, but the danger is right now it is starting to spread in South America because, you know, that's the beginning of their winter. It's the end of our winter up here. It's the beginning of their winter, and we're seeing it in South America, Australia, and uh, starting to spread around, and that means it probably will get a hold because this is very early in their winter, so it may have a long time to really spread and get established that means it may come back around next fall. You see, it may come back up here next fall, so we may get it again, but at least that gives us a number of months to uh, to prepare, get our stockpiles of medical equipment, uh, get a, uh, a rapid uh, test that can be uh, widely employed, uh, get our leadership uh, under control so that, uh, yeah. so that they will take uh, more effective action as quickly as possible. Uh, yep. So okay. so I think it's, although it may well come back, I think it's uh, that would be uh, better than having it spread. Of course, it may persist through the summer. We don't know. Uh, okay. All right. Good question, Arbeen. Here, well, here's yeah. the, uh, one more interesting thing let me talk about, because I think this helps mm -hmm. you understand that. This is a coronavirus, you know, and the coronavirus, there are seven known coronaviruses that affect people. There are about 300 that affect all different species. But um, the first four of the ones that affect humans are cold viruses. It just cause the common cold, and they, they cause about a quarter of the common colds. Uh, okay. well, those are winter viruses, right? Number five was SARS. Number six was MERS, uh, Middle East Respiratory oh. Syndrome. And number seven is this one, all right? Well, MERS is the only one that's not seasonal. It's not a winter virus. But of course, it arose in Saudi Arabia in the desert. So you can see why it might not be. But the other, uh, the other five are very seasonal and they die out in the summer. So that's why, and this one is a very close cousin of SARS. So that's why I think that it's probably going to die out over the summer. But again, that may only be temporary and that may not happen. All right. Good to know. I think a lot of us certainly hope it will. Um, here's a question from Jenny. Is that is social distancing a new term or have you been using that in public health literature for years? Good question. No, I think it's a new term, although I could be mistaken. Uh, although I've been in a lot of these meetings and done a lot of reading about it, but I've not seen that term, but it's a great term. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I think it's becoming very useful, but I think it is new could be corrected though. Okay, well, I know we don't have a whole lot of time, Dr. Haley, but I wanted to find out, you know, the world, it's a lot different than it was a hundred years ago. People are more transient, it's more densely populated. How does this play into what the work that you as an epidemiologist and others are tackling, are doing to tackle COVID-19? I think we've seen uh, the amazing rapidity with which this thing has spread around the world. And of mm -hmm. course, that's very predictable given the way the world is now. Uh, yeah. It's spreading uh, almost as fast as the 1918 flu did, but that was because of the war, you know, mm -hmm. and the traffic across the ocean. But now we just have, uh, that, that's all over the world now. And so this will spread all over the world. M most other countries probably will not be able to deal with it. And so it will just run, uh, it will just run un unrestrained and it will, kill many people. One of the fortunate things about this that also that distinguishes it from, from in, uh, 1918 flu and seasonal flu that we have now is the flu tends to kill people at the extremes of age, the very old and the very young. So it kills children and, and uh, babies. Whereas uh, this new virus, the coronavirus, uh, only uh, 
increase the mortality increases with age, but spares children. Fortunately, that's one of the remarkable differences from the flu, and of course that's very fortunate. And the 1918 flu was different from other flus in that it killed the extremes of age, the very old, the very young, like all flus do. But it was unique, and it also had a big peak in the middle. It killed particularly the healthy, youngest young middle-aged uh, people. And that's why that was just so devastating, particularly in the war. It was killing young people. Well, uh, this one, the, the, the new coronavirus, is not killing young people. You, you know, every young person who dies gets to be national news because it's so rare. But most of the people dying are elderly people, uh, and often who are not well nourished, and we think there's probably a nutritional predisposition to to having a bad time with it, although that's yet to mm -hmm. be proven. Gotcha. We've got, let's see, we've got time for maybe three more questions. We have one here from Anna, and it's, has an antibody testing for COVID-19 develop, been developed, and how will it help? Uh, <clears throat> this is a really interesting story, too. Uh, how can we develop, how, is, how have we developed a, a blood test for this and maybe a vaccine so quickly? And the answer lies in genetics. Uh, this one, the uh, Chinese set a record within just weeks of discovering the virus. They had the virus, uh, the genome sequenced, and they published that and sent it to anybody who wanted it. And it turns out now then you can, you can just take the gene sequence that you can type on a piece of paper, take that gene sequence and use that to develop the antigen. And then from that, you can then develop uh, the blood test and even a, uh, a vaccine. And so you don't have to put this in eggs and, you know, grow it, grow the virus up in eggs and all this stuff to, to do it. Yeah. It's, it's now much more of an automated process based on, uh, on very advanced uh, genetic science. That's amazing. So <laughs> doctor, here's one for, from Crystal. Do you anticipate widespread antibody testing being done so we can get data on who has been infected? And do you think long-term immunity will be conferred by having been infected? Uh, well, first of all, uh, you know, there are two ways of, of testing for this. Right now we're testing with a, a nasal swab that swabs your nose and they put that in a test tube and then test it with PCR, which is actually detecting evidence of the virus. Okay. Uh, then, but there are other tests. In fact, there, there's one that's being used in Colorado to test it. entire towns. Everybody in the town are being tested, but that's testing for antibodies that shows whether you have already had the infection or maybe ha are having it now. Uh, and uh, I think it's more ideal to test the virus for the virus, but on the other hand, those tests aren't as accurate as the antibody test. So I think there'll be a period of time where we'll be trying both of those approaches and there's all kind of new technology just exploding out there and so uh, pretty soon uh, a few techniques will win out and uh, i think by i'm very optimistic that we, by this summer or certainly by next fall we will have some very efficient tests that could test very large numbers of people quickly to allow us to identify the sick ones and isolate them and their contacts to bottle this up the way we did with SARS and MERS, just the way we did. And, and I think we're training our leaders, hopefully, to uh, uh, take the right measures and support the control measures that make these things not uh, catch on so we don't have to close down our economy again. Yeah, yeah. All right, we've got last question, Dr. Dr. Haley. This is from Holly. And it's how sensitive and specific are our current tests for COVID-19 and does the virus need to replicate in the host for several days before it's detectable? So the other the final question is, would a person be contagious before a test would pick it up? Uh, yes, definitely. This is one that can infect people while you're still asymptomatic. And remember, 80% of the people are either asymptomatic or they have such minimal symptoms they may not notice it. And all those people are infected, 80%. Uh, and and now, how sensitive are the tests? The PCR test, the nasal swab, 
Uh, we're not really sure yet. We haven't had time to really test that, but it looks like it's about 70% sensitive. That is, it'll pick up about, seven, it'll be positive in about 70% of the people who have it. Now, you wish it'd be 99%, but 70% is not bad. Uh, but, but now the antibody test would be much more sensitive, uh, close to 100%, but it's, it's a little bit out of date. When you get a positive, it's had to have been there for a week or more. So anyway, gotcha. yeah. Okay, well, I think we are, we're running out of time with you. I need, know you need to get back, but we did get one other great question in from Re Rebecca. And she says, you know, there are so many people out there that are contracting SARS-CoV-2, even when they're wearing CDC recommended PPE, it appears that, you know, may not be enough. What, is there a solution? What is that? I'm not sure there are very many getting it while they're even wearing PPE. Uh, personal protective okay. equipment. I'm sure there will be a few, but it's pretty effective. Um, okay. Yeah. But, but of course, we're, this thing uh, can stay on surfaces. If an infected person coughs on us in a room, well, it, it will settle in the surface on the tabletops and the doorknobs and gets on your hands. And, and so PPE isn't totally effective for that reason that you, it, you may not get it from your respiratory tract, but as you go out the door, you may touch the doorknob and then touch your face. And mm -hmm. that's probably spreading more of the infections than the respiratory route. Okay. All right. Well, I know um, we started a little bit late, Dr. Haley, and you know we've gone for about 25 minutes now. So I want to go ahead and wrap this up. I want to thank everybody for joining us and asking all your questions. Most importantly, thank you, Dr. Haley, for taking the time to answer all these questions. It's been really informative. My pleasure. All right. Well, this chat will be available here, and it'll also be uploaded to our YouTube channel. For those of you that are on YouTube, if you have any questions, please leave them in the comments, and we'll try to get them answered as soon as we can from Dr. Haley. So again, thank you for your time, and have a great day.